It's getting late in the afternoon, but uh, many people have joined. I think we uh, continue now with our last event of the day. The hot seat. The hot seat is a new format that we have uh, developed in order to bring people into the conference room. Obviously, we realize that uh, there's a Berlin airport strike and people had to leave early. But I think something that's very interesting is what we're going to discuss here today. It's a hot seat. It's a hot topic. Those of you who've read the latest press uh, will realize that this is really something in demand, in demand in terms of discussion climate protection, the cruise industry. And we're not just talking about uh, climate protection, but we will in many ways. Before I introduce you to our guests of a panel discussion, let me ask a question to the audience first, as we would. So can we have our vote screen, please? So there we are. So please wait until we read out all three questions, and then you take a decision and press the button. So the first one. What do you agree? Do sustainability and cruising fit together? Cruising in sense of uh, cruise uh, ship uh, travel. If you want to take climate change seriously, energy extensive holidays uh, like uh, cruise holidays are no longer justifiable. Or it contributes to many positive economic effects in the destinations. Therefore, its impact on climate change is secondary. Or the industry should use new technical solutions to uh, prevent emissions, even if this means considerable costs increases. So please tell us, do you go for one, two, or three? I give this. Uh well, we'll see. There's uh, two preferred answers, one and three. Even if it costs money, well, the industry should make sure to uh, boost their technical expertise. And there's some skepticism in the room. Maybe there's some doubters there saying that this industry is not compatible with environmental targets or environmental impact reduction. It's a very compelling panel we have today. We have a co-host, Thomas Illes, who has traveled all the way from Switzerland to be here. He is a cruise analyst, uh, a university lecture, lecturer, and he will chair this discussion with me, with Helge Kramerstorff, who is uh, the German director for CLIA, which is the association of the cruise industry, and Mr. Oliger, Dietmar Oliger, the head of transport policy of uh, NABU, which is the Nature and Biodiversity Conservation Union. And by the way, there was also an article in The Guardian today uh, authored by him. I think it's going to be an exciting discussion. So can I ask you please to join me here on stage? All right. No, okay, let me stand over here to make sure we separate our opponents. All right, so we want to talk about the environment, ecology, etc. Of course, it's post 2016, the year after the Paris Climate Agreement, which is the reason why we're going to focus on uh, climate gas emissions. But we have plenty of time to uh, touch on some background information. So can I ask Thomas to tell us about uh, the cruise industry? Um, is it growing? Is it stagnating? What are the environmental problems that we're talking about in the first place? Right, welcome everybody. And thanks, Stefan, for the words of introduction. And great we have our panelists here on stage. I'm sure it's going to be an exciting discussion, of course. The uh, cruise industry is growing, and no one uh, would doubt that. It's actually growing dramatically. Dramatically, maybe not the word that goes down with many people, but you could ask the question, how much growth can the industry digest? Let me say this. When we talk about uh, the environment and the cruise industry, there's different aspects. We are going to focus on carbon emissions first and foremost here today. Do not confuse that with uh, exhaust gases like sulfur or nitrogen oxide or particulate matter. That's different. And this is also something that rightly so is addressed by the general media or by the general public. But this is not what we are covering now. 
And let me put things in perspective a bit, which I think might be useful to start off our discussion. Imagine you take all cruise ships we have at the high seas. They, in their totality, in their percentage totality of all the seagoing ships, so cargo ships, depend how you, depending how whether you calculate all Indonesian fishing boat or not, they account for 0.5 to 0.75 percent commercial cruises. It's a niche of a niche. Why am I telling you that? I'm telling you that because 90 percent of global trade is sea-based freighter ships. Why is that? Because ocean shipping is cheap. Why is ocean shipping cheap? Because you don't pay for transportation. We consumers are paying too little in terms of transportation costs. The uh, question is, is it a chicken or egg principle? Is uh, shipping so cheap because people don't want to pay, or do we don't want to pay because it's so cheap? The question is that heavy oil that we're hearing about a lot is used in commercial shipping. It's a cheap waste product, a refinery spin-off product that is just burned by the shipping industry. It's relatively cheap, heavy oil, but it generates huge problems, and we uh, know what these are. Now, why am I telling you that? Why am I telling you about commercial shipping or freight shipping? If cruise shipping is to be innovative about introducing innovative technology, and I think it's the right thing to do, let us not forget that these are technologies that have to be developed, number one, have to be built, number two, they have to work reliably, number three, and this is only possible if you have highly specialized suppliers in the industry that want to produce this equipment. If there's a critical mass of volumes where well, the supplier says, okay, there's a commercial business case, we're ready to do some research in that, and if we have a critical number of units sold. But if there's still this contradiction with the cruise ship industry that is doing really well, that is flourishing and is growing exponentially and it's in good financial shape, but in terms of numbers of units or ships are still the niche. And on the other hand, you have container ships, container shipping that is in very dire straits. So 10 years, 10 years in the row we're facing now um, a, a crisis and they're really in bad financial shape, all of them. Now imagine the supplier industry that is developing industry technologies, as we've seen, and you would wish for that to happen. If you tell them, the uh, industry, well, cruise shippers want that and the other ones can't afford it, they can't afford it because for our bananas, we don't want to pay more. Every banana has some sticky heavy oil on it. We have to be aware of it. We believe we need cheap bananas. Okay, let's debate that. But transportation is virtually null for free. Now here comes the crux. How can we make sure that the cruise ship industry or the cruise industry, which also is part of uh, shipping in general and that has to f meet their rules, how can they make sure they team up with the shipyards, with the technology providers to come up with new top-notch technology? And a lot has happened. A lot has happened. So I think I should mention that as a proviso to our discussion. Let us not forget that. Because no matter how that discussion is going to go, it's important to remember. It's one important aspect of it all. We're talking about volumes, numbers. The more ships we have with the latest in technology, the more it makes sense to develop those technologies. If, however, the number remains small because uh, the cruise industry is a niche, it's going to be very hard to bring those to market. But still, a lot has happened. I would be happy to talk about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thomas. So let's get started. Mr. Uh, Grammerstorff, do you think you're attacked for no reason because a lot has happened? Is it unfair, the criticism that people uh, bring forward? Because in the media, you often be called the bogeyman. Isn't that true? No, 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 it's not appropriate. That's what I think. But look at where we're at. Interesting things we've heard already. And we've uh, seen some interesting uh, images here on stage. I'm always wondering, uh, in such uh, controversy that we're having, where is the controversy in the first place? There is no, there is no disputation here, uh, because Mr. Ehrlich and myself have originally been stood uh, by the same table, and then we have been separated by you guys. But at the end of the day, we all agree in general, in principle, the cruise industry and shipping, we are only a minor part of it. We've just heard of that. But 
the uh, cruise industry needs to be more environmentally friendly, more ecologically compatible. And this is not only about being do-gooders, it's about our business model. We want to take our passengers, our customers, to an intact environment that is in good shape, environmentally speaking. Therefore, we're interested in making sure that this happens. No, but then, obviously, I uh, looked at the announcement here. And uh, by the way, this is the first time this is uh, th that I'm supposed to sit uh, in a chair where there is no chair, the hot seat. And the title of this discussion says, Climate Fanaticism versus Losing, versus losing Touch with Reality. Who am I going to be in this discussion? Am I the climate fanaticist? I'm not. But to answer your question, occasionally we feel that we are being scolded for really uh, no apparent reason. But we're not offended. We know we have a great product. We know that this industry, our industry, is investing a lot of money to make it even greener and more economic, um, environmentally friendly. And we're not always agreeing on the uh, rate of change or the speed of change. And I agree with what Mr. Illis has just said. Uh, the problem is that some technical equipment is just not available by the uh, manufacturers. We can tell them, well, why don't you build it and install it in our ships? It's not a question of budget. It's a question of expertise, because we don't have these top-notch diesel engines for ships that are no emissions. So. We don't not only talk about uh, existing fuels and how these can be filtered or used uh, ecologically, but we should also look at alternatives, alternative fuels, making sure that some emissions can be uh, eliminated, like uh, liquefied gas, for instance, is something that's going to be rolled out in the coming years. Now, Mr. Oliger, we're not having a problem. Why are we here in the first place? Yeah, it's my impression. Can't we, can't we call it a day and go home? That's what it sounds like. However, I have to spoil that uh, positive picture there, Mr. Illis. It's not just about uh, carbon emissions, which uh, rightly so. Well, leaving aside uh, the climate change doubters is uh, the main polluters. But the conventional polluters, nitric oxide, uh, particulate matter, uh, have been classified by scientists as uh, polluters number two and three and hazardous to the climate. Now, when we talk about that, let us please realize that, especially in shipping, we are facing a humongous problem. And those dream ships uh, that have old age pensioners on board, uh, you know, travel the world oceans. OK, sorry, I should polemicize, but it's not only, it's not only about uh, pensioners, you know, traveling the high seas. But quite seriously, you've been talking about dramatic growth. It's true. The, generally, the shipping industry, not only cruise industry, is growing dramatic, dramatically. So I think they are also responsible and have to be liable for what they do. We, as an environmental pressure group, do not uh, demand illusory targets to be met. Quite on the contrary, we demand their, that they take their responsibility, use clean fuels. And if they do that, overnight, literally overnight, we could solve the big problems out there. A scientist at Calc for us has calculated uh, the environmental impact. And if you compare that uh, passenger cars versus cruise ships, and the cruise ship industry is criticizing us for that, you see, if you take one cruise ship and compare their emissions in sulfurous oxide, because they use uh, sulfurous fuel with n no exhaust gas after treatment, that is compatible or comparable to 370 million passenger cars. Mind you, this is not peanuts. These are huge amounts of pollutants. And I think the industry shouldn't chicken out on that. No, no, I do agree with you, indeed. I agree there's a problem with sulfurs, with particles, with uh, nitrogen, etc. I just wanted to avoid to mix up these things. They, you can't separate it. Well, you can separate it, I believe, because we've got LNG now. This is a clean fuel, but still, it has a CO2 problem, so we can separate it. And this is what we wanted to point out. It's not only important to have a so-called clean fuel, and then all the problems are solved. No, as long as we need fossil fuels and use them, we do have uh, CO2 problems. This is what I was aiming at. Apart from that, you're right, of course. 
sulfur and nitrogen particle problems. This is a big problem indeed, uh, but uh, the cruise industry is very innovative, and uh, I agree with you on everything you've said. No ship is equipped with it, N not a cruise ship in any case. Well then, tell me what you want to, to have. What should the cruise ships have? What should they be equipped with? Well, maybe there are 200 ships uh, with catalysts uh, for uh, nitrogen oxide. Everybody knows it. This is something that we've known since the various scandals in um, road traffic. Um, there are, are several catalysts. This is the um, state of the art. Why are there still 95% of uh, new ships and which are not equipped uh, with these nitrogen oxide catalysts? Well, this is a question of time, but I would like to talk about what Mr. Ullinger said. I thought you mentioned passenger cars. I thought we had finished the discussion. So just asked to confront you with your own figures. It is just recently that you said that a cruise ship um, emits as um, many emissions as uh, 5 million passenger cars. But I think now it's 1 million passenger cars. So uh, you've never um, disclosed any of these figures or given the evidence for these uh, figures. But apparently, the situation has proved tremendously. No, sorry. Five million. Uh, this has been calculated through the three main pollutants, soot particles. This is the most dr dramatic pollutant as far as health is uh, concerned because they can uh, generate uh, cancer according to the WHO. Everybody knows that. And then uh, sulfur dioxide or nitrogen dioxide. We um, calculated it according to the individual pollutants. And with regard to uh, sulfur dioxide, we've got um, several million, one to one million with regard to soot particles. And what else? Uh, nitrogen oxide, I think it's 1 to 15 million. And uh, you criticize it, criticize it. What you don't know yet is that you never published the investment data. We um, asked uh, the various cruise uh, industry representatives uh, for them. You don't know about it, but what mean uh, gave us the data. And we had to look at it, and we even did a very conservative calculation. The data prove quite clearly uh, that we were right in our calculations done by academics. And there are not any other calculations, no other measurements uh, provided by the cruise industry proving the opposite. This brings me back to my uh, question. Well, Caribbean is a good example. They've got a subsidiary, a joint venture with co cruises. They have got a catalyst. They've got a scrapper. This is an exhaust gas washing device. Why does Okoribe not have it? Because this is the same uh, company. Why don't they have uh, this catalyst? Well, I can't uh, give you any details about the individual companies. I can just tell you, as far as the shipping companies in Germany are uh, concerned, and Mr. Ullinger will agree, uh, these companies have made great progress as far as these uh, exhaust gas washing devices are concerned. Maybe others have not made as much progress. I don't know why, but if you uh, equip ships uh, with these aggregates, it's not really easy. This is really um, very uh, difficult. But Joe Karibik builds new ones as well. So it, it is possible, theoretically speaking. But there is no legislation. And if there is no legislation, if it is not required by the law, uh, it is not being done because it costs money. No, this is not right. This is really uh, very difficult, you say, but this is not quite true because uh, AIDA, we criticize AIDA. In 2013, AIDA um, decided to improve their image and they presented to the public around the world. They said, we will equip our entire fleet with particle filters by 2016 and by um, uh, catalyst, but no uh, catalyst has been uh, built in because the technology doesn't uh, work well. But EDA's got a um, contract for 100 million, and they also uh, communicated it to the press. You need to check whether the technology works beforehand, don't you? Well, uh, secondly, there's AIDA Prima. This was communicated as being the most environmentally, environmentally friendly ship around the world, but uh, we measured it in our team, and there are huge emissions, so it is not true. The uh, sector um, uh, thinks that the people, the passengers, are stupid. And this is not uh, acceptable. What about you? Maybe you should um, take the floor now. 
No, another question to you. I'm wondering, uh, science means that you are uh, supposed to provide data so that others can um, get the evidence based on data. Now, apparently, we've got different information. Why can the sector not provide an independent report on the actual emissions? Well, this is a uh, work in progress when talking about uh, our air emissions and how do we deal with them. We have the scandal problems, uh, we've got the uh, water for washing, etc., and examinations are ongoing of the Federal Environmental Agency and several other organizations and the sector as, as such. Uh, so when will you do this? This It will be published this year. Well, the federal authority said that a scrubber is a technology that can't be recommended for environmental reasons. No, this is not what was said. The federal agency responsible for the environment is that, uh, well, the water is filtered and this water is not a problem. So what about the cumulative effect? We don't know. Uh, but. Um, I'm quite thankful that you mentioned the problems uh, regarding the filters. And here, I think we've got the problem that we both have. Uh, over many years, we always had a, um, a black and white discussion. We could uh, build in filters against soot particles, for instance, and industry representatives said we've got that. And we've not made any progress. I think in the future, we need to differentiate further. Regarding um, soot particles, we need to differentiate between the size of the particles. And this is something we also communicated to the public at large. We've got um, size of t 10 mu and 2.5 mu. This is what is generally used uh, in terms of size. And there are filters available. And this is uh, rather successful. But this is not what you mean. Because what you sometimes uh, say, you do have some campaign uh, images. You've got a ship with uh, a black suit uh, emissions. This is quite impressive. But the blacks, uh, the black uh, particles are the big particles. Um, Temu, they also are dirty, but they are not hazardous for your health. The question is about the very small particles, and this is the discussion we've had, rightfully so, by the way. Because this is a question difficult to answer, the um, volume is much lower, of course, but regarding the ship's engines, there are filters which can fill which cannot filter these small particles. We can ask the industry to do that, but we simply can't purchase these filters. It's not a question about uh, the price, because these filters don't uh, exist. The industry is not able to deliver these filters. Apart from that, whenever you do measurements, uh, especially if you do that um, in secret, which is a shame, they are done um, at certain points, and they are not done according to scientific standards. And these are not really long-term measurements, but the measurements are just uh, made here and there. And unfortunately, and this is, is something that uh, is not taken into account sometimes, so unfortunately there's no differentiation between suit particles and other very small particles, salt crystals and other things. And this is not being separated. And I think it's also a shame that this is uh, carried out with measurement instruments, which should be used uh, in laboratories and not uh, outside, definitely not in the sea. Maybe I have to explain this to the audience, because we carry out a cruise ranking once per year, and we uh, have as a criterion environmentally friendliness. Um, and last year, uh, only aggregate data was delivered, so we don't get uh, data per cruise, but for the sector as a whole. Uh, fortunately, we were able to differentiate, and we asked about how many particle filters are used. And Mr. Karmastov said 23 um, ships have a suit particle filter. And then we asked about it, and the journalist asked about it. Maybe you can uh, g give us the name of one cruise ship with a suit particle filter. You don't get an answer to this question. And uh, something on the measurements. The Helmholtz uh, Institute is definitely a renowned organization. They offered uh, to the cruise industry to carry out measurements. No answer. We told Aida, look, just choose any institute, Turf, uh, um, German Lloyd, for instance. If you don't like uh, measurements, if you think they are not scientific, you can choose another institute. We will just observe the process. No answer, no willingness to uh, do this. So nobody is interested in publishing these results because um, they are afraid of the results, of course. Um, Plus, minus, for instance, um, 
said and reported that there are small children uh, doing ice skating uh, next to the emissions, and then you've got emissions uh, 200 fold of what you've got next to a busy street. This is a me- message you definitely can't use, and uh, this is why the industry is just not interested in this. We said we want to agree on scientific standards on how these measurements are to be carried out, and we can take a look at it together. But just to point it out very clearly once again. There is this example of the measurement device. The manufacturer says this and that measurement device is to be used in laboratories. If you use it outside, it is just not worth it. If you take a look at other measurements, there are public uh, measurements, for instance. There is a measuring station in the uh, port in the harbor of Hamburg next to the uh, terminal in Altona. And this public measurement station shows um, and published uh, several uh, figures. Um, this is uh, These are some figures that were published in the plus minus um, TV station. And the ambient air has not changed according to the measurement. It does not ma- matter whether there's a cruise ship in front of the station or not. Uh, you can't measure it. You can take a look at the website uh, and you can click on it real time. You get the real time result. But these are different data. Maybe you can give us the name of one cruise ship with a um, particle filter. No, I won't do this. So the answer is no. OK, one question to you. Do you think that the ARD Broadcasting Station team, re- which reported on these particles, do you think that these 500,000 were in the air or not? Well, uh, the measuring device is not or was not appropriate. No, there is no specific measuring device for ships. No, but you need one that you can use outside. Well, what? this is your own report. Uh, well, of course. Mr. Ullinger, we heard something about a report that will be published this year. Well, I don't know what will be published, but it has been commissioned, right? Yes, there's the examination that is still ongoing. So. Um, We would like to get figures on soot particles, fine uh, dust, NOx and SO2, right? Yes, and we don't want to have this calculation uh, with this uh, comparison with the passenger cars. No, we want to hear it from you. You can take a look at the calculation on the internet. But in any case, we wanted to talk about climate change today. We had the former vice chairman of the IPCC here at the trade show, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and she quite impressively said that the two degrees uh, target on climate stabilization is a dangerous um, goal. She said, we are not even uh, closely uh, reaching this target. Uh, The uh, target will be rather four degrees centigrade. And to her, well, it's not about two or four degrees centigrade. This is really um, a scenario which is quite gloomy. Usually, I like to talk about the details here because um, we would like to talk about climate climate issues here. Currently, there are emissions of approximately 4.5, 4.8 um, CO2 per person per year. There's one study according to which the emissions from the global cruise industry is 170 kilo CO2 per day on average. That means if you go on a 10-day cruise ship tour, then this is already uh, a large part of the CO2 budget of the average person. Are these value uh, start you address in the industry? And what are we to do? This uh, means high energy intensity. So what should we do? Well, um, we had these questions earlier on. And they included the statement that uh, the cruise industry is very energy intensive. Well, we haven't uh, provided any evidence for this. We don't really know yet. Secondly, we are very proud of this industry. This is the nicest holidays you can have. But this year, for the first time, we had two million passengers from Germany. Given given, uh, 70 million package tools, travelers, this is really not a lot. We already heard the comparison, how many ships there will be in the future. And depending on how you um, add up, we are between 0.5 and 0.7 percent of the world um, uh, trade fleet. We would like to make our contribution towards uh, um, reducing emissions. But we don't we are not really a crucial factor to us to save the world's climate what we can do is something we 
do actually do. And we really do a lot. I've already said there are quite a few ships that have been ordered with um, liquefied um, gas engines. They cost approximately one billion per ship. And the shipping companies commissioned these ships, although today they can't really um, know whether in 2018, 19, 20, etc., there will be a high performing infrastructure so as to um, put fuel into these ships. So it's an investment for the future, and we are right ahead of uh, this. And uh, this is um, quite good to make these investments, although we don't know today whether we will be able to have the infrastructure for this uh, much cleaner um, ships and technology. And we need the support of the politicians. We also need standards. It is not acceptable that a ship, just as uh, Ida Prima, um, has this uh, new technology in uh, harbor. And there are eight uh, different uh, ports and harbors with eight different uh, regulations in eight different countries. This is not acceptable. So a lot still needs to be done. And I hope that we will get the support of uh, NABU. Yes, absolutely. We also um, said that we agreed on this. Uh, this is very laudable. If you switch to liquefied uh, gas, as far as the classical air pollutants are concerned, you get a significant improvement with regard to CO2. Um, the figures are, well, um, not as um, positive as um, they are communicated. As far as uh, the problem of decarbonization is concerned, we don't have a solution. This is why I mentioned it. Yes, but we are not people just fantasizing and saying, well, simply use batteries and use wind energy so as to um, use this for the batteries. We know that the technology is limited. Nobody knows what the future will hold in store. So uh, this is definitely an important first step. And we've also praised it publicly, what you uh, did. How, uh, for how long do you use such a ship on average? Mr. Gramersdorf. Traditionally speaking, until a short time ago, um, these ships were used for 30, 40 years, sometimes longer. Whether this will um, remain the same period of time with regard to the long uh, ships, I don't know. But in any case, it's more than 20 years. But even today, you need to take decisions for situations uh, in the future that we can't really forecast. Uh, we don't know what will happen in 10, 15 years' time. This is why we need long-term planning. And this is why we need to equip the ships in such a way that at least we've got the option to use fuels in the future that will exist in 20 years' time still. Since we're talking about time, um, sometimes people um, say we should need a time schedule for threshold values for the usability of fuel, etc. Um, this is um, absolutely justified, but these things have already been agreed upon and uh, implementation has started, especially the cruise industry has been actively involved by the International Shipping Organization has not used the option to uh, reduce the sulfur um, content of ships by 0.5 percent or to 0.5 percent. Sorry, um, this decision was taken in October 2016. So as of 2020, this will be introduced, and this is a huge step because you need to guarantee supply as well. And this global limitation needs to be implemented as well. So uh, as far as the supervisory authorities are concerned, we want to make sure that everybody abides by these rules because it must be applicable to everybody. But still a question to you. We agree here that this is an industry characterized by strong growth. I think we agree on that. Furthermore, we agree on the following. We need to take a climate change more seriously. Um, there are expectations. Um, and emissions need to be reduced. We also agree that LNG is just um, a transi uh, uh, transition uh, in terms of a solution because it is also a fuel. Now, the question is, these ships are used for such a long period of time to how to deal with it because it's not just a small business model that you've got. And as an academic uh, person, I'd like uh, to ask, what about LNG um, supply? What will happen? On the other hand, what about the future, uh, the long-term future, not just the next five years? Well, yes, we've uh, looked into this, definitely. But I think we can all um, confirm this, everybody here on the panel, LNG is the uh, option for the long-term future. That's the option we currently have. 
other feasible technologies such as fuel cells, electricity generated by uh, hydropower, etc. These are options we can ponder about. There is research being done, but they are so far away from implementation from today's point of view that we can't really include this seriously into our models. Yes, I can only agree with this, with what Mr. Gramstoff said. North Korean, for instance, build new ships and will build new ones. Uh, they say LNG is to be combined with the fuel cells, and they test this uh, in stationary ships already. So it's a pri prototype technology that is on the test bed at the moment. It needs to be uh, developed further. Hertington in Norway, they've got hybrid propulsion methods. They've got certain small uh, um, journeys that uh, they can um, use, where they can use their ships with batteries. In spite of all the criticism, um, I asked why one shipping company uses catalysts and another one doesn't. So I'm quite critical as well. Yet, I think that passenger shipping journeys also includes a ferries because usually people underestimate it. They say, well, ferry boats are quite different compared to cruises. No, but usually they are the pioneers in terms of innovation because you can find a lot of them in Europe. Experiments are being done, but quite seriously, People think about what can be the next step beyond LNG. And here I have to say that according to my um, estimation, the passenger cruises and very boat uh, industry, they are very innovative. And um, they might be a driver for further innovation for the remaining sectors of the shipping industry, if the uh, shipping industry is willing to pay for this. And this is... Um, uh, our need in transport, where sometimes we're not willing to pay. Then another question that just comes up to my mind. Is there anybody who asked a passenger about how much they would be willing to pay more so as to have an environmentally friendly ship? Well, if this is the criterion you use so as to estimate our innovation um, and our willingness to invest into new technologies, uh, if we use this uh, criterion, then we can't make any progress. Uh, but this is a destiny we've got, not only us, but others as well. Also in this country, we can have a lot of TV programs on health promoting food stuff, health hazardous food, etc. We can also link this to prices. At the end of the day, uh, consumers will go to the discounters and buy the cheapest meat they can get, so it is very difficult. And the same holds true um, as far as passengers of these ships are concerned. The environmental issues are not really that important. Unfortunately, they are not vital for the decision to go on holidays. Nonetheless, we are still active in this field. I fully confirm what you've just said. There are um, various approaches in terms of technology depending on the use of the ships and where the ships are to be uh, located. Uh, the first LNG ships uh, were used in Scandinavia because this is where you can find the natural resource of this gas. This was a huge ship. There's one ship which uses LNG in the harbour at least, but um, you also have to say that we don't have the infrastructure so far. So um, um, it is difficult. You need lorries um, with LNG. They then have to go uh, to the harbours because maybe you could get the gas from Rotterdam, the lorry with the gas has to go to Scandinavia to the ship. So this is not very environmentally friendly. And this shows that it is very difficult to implement these technologies. It is easy to say, well, just do it tomorrow. But it's a question of um, feasibility and talking about electric uh, propulsion. The ships are equipped with this. But the question is how the um, electricity is generated. Today, we don't have solar cells which provide high performance or batteries which provide full capacity for all our ships so that we've got sufficient electricity for the ships. Maybe you can use it on a ferry boat with less passengers, um, short distance. This is um, partly feasible, whether this is really a good um, uh, version or option in terms of environmental uh, friendliness. Because we need to get the electricity onto the ship, and there uh, we can switch off a highly efficient uh, power plant so as 
to have a carbon fire power plant somewhere uh, else. This uh, means that the overall um, organic or environmental um, balance sheet is no longer any better. And it is not that the cruise industry um, is a, a will become a pioneer in terms of this. No, it has become a pioneer already. May, maybe, Mr. Ullinger, we can agree on the following. You say, OK, we have exerted pressure, and this has also made an impact. The cruise industry is an innovation driver, as you say, with regard to many aspects. There are also other things, such as wastewater and sewage plants on uh, the ships, etc. We can't can't talk about all these things for lack of time. But maybe we can say, since you've exerted pressure, the industry has moved ahead together with the legislators. You mentioned this, and this uh, was also important because the uh, rules have been changed. So a lot of innovative technology has been established for the uh, cruises. And maybe, uh, Mr. Gramostov, these are two questions to the two of you. Mr. Gramostov, maybe you can say, since this pressure has been exerted by NABU and others, you have uh, moved forward. You wouldn't have um, implemented these measures um, were it not for NABU. Can we agree on these statements so far, or um, is there a, a lack of a consensus here? Well, I think we can fully agree on that immediately. Um, but um, I don't know about Mr. Ullinger. It was not NABU itself and only as the only association. But there has also been a public discussion on the climate change. How can we influence this? What can we do? This has had an influence. And I'm very glad about the fact um, that uh, NABU has various award. I think the Environmental Dinosaur, for instance, is an award you provided. And in the speech of last year, um, Nabu said a lot has changed in terms of uh, the environmental friendliness, especially in the cruise industry. It's not only uh, work that goes into cruise ships. Uh, we look at uh, official uh, shipping. Uh, the federal government of Germany owns hundreds of ships, by the way. We look at cargo ships as well. So of the public government-owned ships and the cruise industry, this is where people make money. This is where people are moved, not containers. So we expect those who are in charge to lead by example. And this is why we believe innovation must come from this sector of the industry. And it goes without saying that cargo shipping is actually much more of a problem Imagine we leave the oil age, uh, one third of uh, the uh, shipping industry would disappear because they're all oil tankers. So um, a lot needs to happen. But we believe that the cruise industry must be and should be the innovation driver going forward. And it is an innovation dr driver. It is already and it can do more. It is still too little if the new LNG ships come to market and uh, the first uh, cut has been made at the shipyard. So I think we cannot revert that situation. So something really is happening going forward. And if that is happening, we will honor that. We will appreciate that. And it's going to be interesting to see how the journey continues. Obviously, we're not going to stop our activities overnight, because very often we get the feedback both from the policymakers and the shipyards saying, well, yes, please keep the pressure going. And many cruise uh, um, ship owners are saying, uh, yes, please keep, the, uh, keep your strategies going, because these are just uh, people that do not close their eyes of, uh, in front of reality. So yes, there is some pressure, and people realize that something needs to be, do be done. And therefore, our pressure group activities are very important. This it gives us some backing when we negotiate with um, you know, the big businesses who want to just go down the cheap path. Well, you should uh, say thank to the, thanks to the NABU. Of course, we'll be missing him if he's not around anymore. OK, now we're getting too comfy again. And I think it's a good point to stop our discussion here. We have to finish on time. Time's just uh, disappeared. I think we could go on and on. I'm sure I could have answered or could have asked more questions. Uh, we have to hold that for later. Many thanks indeed for listening, for being here. Many thanks to our contenders here on stage uh, who are happy to go for that experiment. And I think we're a, a bit more positive in terms of where we go.